for those of you who know Bangkok, it is a very intense city. It's enormous, uh, it goes on forever. We are located pretty much in the dead center of the urban mass, um, adjacent to Lumpini Park, which is a kind of a large green area in the center of the city. Uh, and of course, the challenge with any embassy building is how do you make sense of the host country and also the country to which is being represented without falling into cliche or without falling into kind of twee uh, narrative responses. And this has been a challenge for us in the sense of how we do this. So our approach to this project has been about the idea of Australia as this kind of ancient, uh, extraordinary, visceral, continental mass where it is apparently the oldest landmass on the surface of the earth at the moment. Uh, and it has this extraordinary richness about its color, about its texture, about the nature of its rocks, of its stones, of its landscape, of its fauna, of its flora. And this idea of edges, these colors, it's you know, a very rich place. Bangkok has a much more lush, rich, uh, open, um, flowing approach, both culturally and physically. Uh, and that is therefore represented in the building as it exists now. The embassy is a highly secure environment. Uh, Bangkok uh, is Australia's second largest mission overseas and uh, sits in a quite complex security environment. The idea of abstracting landscape is obviously a challenge that you can fall into simplicity about how you might do that. So we've taken the colours, the ideas, the way that the bits and pieces of stone, etc., come together, the way that water flows around to help give us some ideas about how to approach the design of the building, which resolves itself as two discrete masses. The fundamental uh, requirement of the project is two primary elements, a chancery building on your left and a head of mission residence on your left. The chancery building is essentially an office building and the head of mission residence is essentially a small conference centre entertainment space. Uh, and linking these things together is a guard wall along the bottom of the page there. So one enters into part of the public area of the embassy through this guard wall which faces the street. Uh, Lumpini Park is to your left uh, into the Chancery building uh, and then to the right, the home. Uh, the building is surrounded by a Thai landscape which we worked in collaboration with a Thai landscape architect and this is about a year ago, this photograph. Now it is incredibly lush already because of its tropical environment. Bangkok is about 13 degrees north of the equator. It is hot, it is humid. Uh, things grow there extraordinarily quickly. The building is surrounded by a water mass, which is a traditional Thai method of dealing with climate. Uh, and that water mass comes into the building to help the internal environment as well. One enters the Chancery building through the guard wall uh, with Australian materials, so there's an Australian marble, an Australian brick. Uh, each building is represented by a different palette, slightly different palette of materials into a small compression space, which immediately kind of removes you from the hustle and bustle of Bangkok, and then into the embassy compound uh, via a covered way into an entry point, water on the ground, and then inside into a rich Australian palette. Uh, we've used Australian brush box, which is a hardwood, Australian marble on the floor, which is called Pilbara Red from Western Australia, uh, and a range of other Australian materials to give a sense of warmth and texture and humanity to an, an embassy. People often go to embassies in times of duress. They've lost a passport, they have a visa issue, something else has happened, they've been injured, etc., etc. So the sense that you have something soft and something tactile to contact was very important. The pallet travels through the public area and into the private area of the Chancery Building for staff spaces, etc., uh, which then engage the small theatrette, um, multi space, and then to an internal atrium which has water at its base, uh, glass line for security reasons and timber uh, areas, steel from Australia, again referencing Australia's resource economy, bridges crossing the atrium to the various different functions. And then various parts of the building open onto that atrium space for staff to have relief, to have the benefit of the water and the natural light coming down. Sunlight tends to come straight down in the tropics, so the atrium is highly um, engaged with the light inside that space. 
into the office areas. Again, trying to keep that power through. There isn't a front and a back or a, a hierarchy of quality of space. And then the staff cafeteria then opens onto that atrium as well. Into the head of mission residence through a copse of trees. Again, to a landscape, more bodies of water. Covered walkway, you need covered walkways. It's either pouring with rain or a thousand degrees. One or the other. And into the head of mission residence, which is essentially a small entertainment slash conference centre for a whole range of different functions, co cocktail functions, uh, small meetings, etc, etc. Dinners, um, external functions. So it's got highly layered spaces with protection, uh, with approaches to how you might inhabit the outside, inhabit the inside, and to soften the sense of security, which is inherent in the building typology. More brush box lining, a different brick, uh, and then the actual residence itself. We've drawn the colours and the palette from the Australian landscape, this idea of these ancient trees, these ancient land masses, colours, textures, etc. Um, go quite quickly here. We've developed a new brick with local Thai brick makers. Thailand had lost its brick making culture. It's been re-energised by this project. Uh, there's a red brick now which has been developed between Australia and Thailand, which has been used in the building and is now for sale across Thailand. Across the space, you can see the kind of hierarchy of different things in a brief video. The building sits surrounded by future development, which is uh, sadly wiping out lots of the existing context around us. Um, the building is limited, so the amount of external glazing it can have. It, it's very much a building and an interior as a single holistic approach to the design to represent Australia and to represent Australia in Thailand. Thank you very much. Run with a question from Tom all the way down the line, and then next time we can do it the other way around. So, Tom. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. The um, I suppose a slightly technical question, the thermal model of the building, you've got water in the base of the atrium. I mean, is that all, all kind of figured and, and con configured in terms of why you did it and how you did it? And is it keeping the space cool and fresh? And so a, a couple of different jobs. One is the presence of it and the, when you're inhabiting the space, the sense that you can see and hear water. It's not open to the outside. It is enclosed. It's a controlled body of water. Um, it does help cool the building, but only very minorly. It's more of a presence and a, an idea of the water rather than an actual active function in the building. Okay. And just very quickly, I think there's an interesting sequence of uh, link spaces or root spaces. When you go in from the street, you hit a very hard concrete space and then inside there are some softer timber spaces and then the one you just had with that blobby void thing with all the fins. Yep. The, the, sorry, that's not a very technical phrase, but um, it, they, how do they all link together? There's, there's some quite different things. So it is, so you do definitely go through a transition from the outside in the Bangkok hustle and bustle through the guard wall up a covered way, which does seem complex in the imagery, but actually when you're in the space, it's far more legible. Uh, and it does gradually get you to the inside from a harder palette to a softer palette and a more tactile palette, essentially. So it's about that transition into the building. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I had a question about wayfinding. Uh, you know, I found the, the plan quite confusing. I mean, this, is, this building is... Could you just leave that on there for a second? Uh, is available, I mean, it's obviously you have public coming public coming into the building. I mean, there's no signage that I could have seen to tell people where to go. So that's, yeah, very so, quickly to So when, so you approach, there's a street along this bottom of the screen here, and when you approach the building, it's actually quite clear where the entry point is. There is a quite a large sign. Right. Uh, as a visitor, there is only one logical point of entry, which is on that uh, bottom left corner there. If you're a, 
uh, going to a formal function in the home, there is a secondary entry to that. So when you actually come into the building, there's quite a clear entry point, which then takes you straight up a covered way into the building. And you can't actually see through, partly because of security, but the wayfinding is quite clear. You really only have one choice about how to get into the building. Right. And the, can I ask another question very quickly? Acoustics. You've got very hard surfaces, wooden floors, uh, concrete, glass. You know, is, uh, are there any acoustic issues? Uh, no, we haven't had any acoustic issues. So part of the acoustic performance is in the complexity and the diversity of the spaces. So we don't have a kind of a box situation where sound is bouncing around, sound is kind of fragmented as it bounces around. There is acoustic insulation behind much of the timber lining uh, and on some of the soffit spaces. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm curious about the spatial narrative. You mentioned lots about Australian materials and uh, effects of light and surface. And I'm trying to understand how you kind of resolve uh, what I perceive as a conflict between a sort of Alvar Aalto language and a Mesian language. They seem to be, they sort of sit happily together, but I, uh, I'm wondering whether that conflict is something you enjoy exploring. And the other thing is, um, maybe this is a really crass interpretation, but is the plan the one of Australia? No. And in which case, where's Tasmania? <laughs> so it's definitely not the plan of Australia. But um, it's a bit like if you put uh, it on the side. It has been commented on before, but certainly it isn't the intention. Which is a bit um, naff, let's be it, honest. Absolutely. <laughs> no, there's certainly no uh, direct reference such as that. Um, so yes, there is the complexity of language, and I, I think Alto was very much a... Uh, inspiration for the project, uh, the Mesian Steelwork. So it comes from a long, long time ago. Indeed, indeed. And part from a different part of the world. True, but part of the idea there is about the use of natural light in Alto's work. So the central atrium essentially enlivens the entire space with light. So that's, that's kind of the key mechanism to bring activity and life down into the building via that atrium. And because of the nature of security, that's very filtered light. It's not a, perhaps a traditional office environment, uh, office atrium, which is completely open. It's highly controlled, so the light is filtered through the glazing, etc. But that doesn't help with a spatial language or any spatial narrative. You know, we're talking. We're here looking at an interior. We're not really yes. uh, supposed to be judging it as a piece of architecture. Yes, absolutely. So the spatial narrative is about the change of the compression of space as you go into the building to remove you from uh, the high hustle and bustle into the calmness of the interior. And then depending on what you're doing, you then pass through another sequence of spaces to which a function one, or to which, an event. Which space in particular do you want us to look at? The one with the, with the angular sofas? Well, that's the main, that is the main public space in the building. Uh, so as a casual visitor, this is the space that you will come into. And if alternatively you go into the residence, if you're going to a function, but this is the main public space that you would go into, yes. Okay, uh, I find these embassies like uh, showcases of each country and uh, this looks quite international to me with the Alvar Alto lightning sand <laughs> and so on. So uh, have you used some special Australian furniture or textiles or uh, so handcraft in, in yes. the interior? So the furniture is a mix of international and local Australian joinery. Uh, so Australia doesn't have a particularly robust furniture industry, unfortunately. Uh, some of the pieces are from Australia. Most of the built-in joiners are built by Australian joiners, but the f some of the furniture is very much an international um, idea. And there is this narrative there about Australia internationally. Australia is the country, Australia in Thailand and Thailand. So there is a, a mix there going on about what the, what the embassy is representing. Thank you. I'm quite impressed by um the inspiration that comes from um, the beauty of Australian nature and its landscape and materials. Um, however, I'm trying to figure out, um, because this is an embassy, so it will have um, strong delimitations of spaces that are public, private, accessibility. How did you uh, create a narrative of this space uh, linked to 
this richness, this explosion of materials, colors, textures that uh, could come, you know, yeah. come up in, in a collage rather than something uh, systemic yes. and organized. And, and I think that's the fundamental challenge of yeah. the project is how you do represent that, but where mm. the actual public space is extraordinarily limited to where you can get into, essentially on the left-hand side. So there's an external space, which is very much about the Thai landscape and an internal space, which is really more about the Australian uh, landscape, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So it's sort of an internal Australian landscape and external Thai landscape, which is experienced by the visitor as they pass through into the building. Coherence as to how it all comes together is present when you're there, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, it is difficult to represent. The, I the idea is that at all times you feel connected to both, really. Mm -hmm. So you can see in and you can see out as much as the security overlay will let you do so. I actually have no problems with your Alvar Alto reference. There's so many bad architecture out there that I think I admire the humility that you use as a precedent because Alvar Alto is not necessarily a specific region. It's his sensibility of how light comes to play. So I think you've addressed that very well. My question is your diagram. You talk about this landmass, which I see in your architecture. And I see that building, which is absolutely beautiful. But in that landmass and in that diagram, outside of that landmass is a clearing. It's this beautiful landscape. So I'm going to assume that what you said is true, that the landscape right now is extremely lush. Mm -hmm. However, there's that walkway, that interstitial space that connects the landscape and the architecture. That to me is very much interior. I feel like that is neither part of the building, which is the landmass, nor is it part of the landscape. So I'm curious that walkway what is that to you is that part of the building so or is that part of the landscape if you understand my question uh, in thai architecture covered ways are a very common um, artifact because of the climate it's either too hot or it's too wet so it is in essence part of that idea that you need to get from this space to that space and you need to protect yourself so it is part of the transition from the thai environment to the australian environment as you pass through so arguably it's neither but both Okay. Answer. okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much.